Chapter 2 Sankhya Yoga, the Yoga of Knowledge. So, we completed Chapter 1 of the Gita last week, and I told you the first six chapters talk about the sequence of spiritual development. That's important to know to understand the flow of thought, right? So, how you start is with sorrow. Sorrow in the sense, you are the Supreme Self and the minute you leave the Self and assume this individuality, it's called sorrow because you feel that agitation, unfulfillment, since you're not in your real state. <clears throat> It's like you take a stick and you bend it. There's a pressure because it's not in its original state. So your original state is the self. You have bent yourself and you believe yourself to be this individual. This particular height, this weight, this race, this age. It's not who you are. You are nothing short of the supreme almighty Brahman divinity. So, this is called sorrow. Because you're not in your original state, you feel that unfulfillment and all kinds of desires are generated by you to try and fill that void. This is the sorrow, which was very elaborately depicted in chapter 1. We completed that, right? The whole thing is Arjuna Vishada Yoga. The description of Arjuna's sorrow. So, how you overcome this sorrow, the starting point is knowledge. You need to understand because ignorance is the cause of the sorrow. So, the only remedy for ignorance is knowledge. That's the second chapter. Sankhya Yoga. Sankhya means this penetrating discrimination, analysis. Sankhya actually means analysis. You have to investigate, you have to analyze deep what life is really all about. That's what the second chapter is. And then with that knowledge, you put it into practice in the world. That's the third chapter of the Gita, Karma Yoga, the path of action. And acting with knowledge, you gradually remove your desires and attachments. This is the fourth and fifth chapter. Renunciation, detachment, objectivity. And finally, it culminates in meditation. Very, very long way off. When all the desires are quiet, your mind is ready for enlightenment. That's the sixth chapter, Dhyana Yoga. So there is a lot of preparation to follow, a lot of knowledge, understanding, action. That is the practice. So in the 
flow of topic of this chapter so this chapter is 72 verses it's the second longest chapter in the gita the longest is the last chapter which is 78 so from chapter 1 it continues to describe his despondent condition 1 to 10 then the second topic since Arjuna is worried about killing his kith and kin. Krishna straight away gives him the highest philosophy to negate that. Not that he's in a condition to understand, but more to dazzle him. But for us, you have to understand, this is the truth, that the real self can never be destroyed. The consciousness within is indestructible, immortal. The mortal layers get destroyed. 11 to 30. Then he talks about you have to focus on your duty in this world. That should be everybody's focus. What do I ought to do? In this case, Arjuna is a warrior. He ought to kill. He ought to kill unrighteousness. So versus such selfless Obligatory actions are desired in actions, 41 to 44. But it is desireless actions that lead to enlightenment. That's topic 5, 45 to 53. And topic 6, one of the most fascinating portions in any scriptural literature, anywhere in the world. Sthita Pragnya, the description of an enlightened soul. 18 verses, 54 through 72. So I've told you, at least some of those who are new, these topics are not there in the original Gita. This is Swamiji's original contribution. So I would definitely recommend if you don't have his commentary, that particular commentary by Swamiji, you should uh, definitely get it. So you follow the flow of thought when I'm also explaining it to you. Um, so this is the flow of thought. So what you must understand before we get into the topic is, I'll mention it, why Ar Krishna is giving Arjuna the highest philosophy in 11 to 30. It's like literally like an Upanishad. 11 to 30 is not practical. It is more metaphysical what the truth of life is. And Arjuna is in no condition to understand that. He's highly emotional. But if you go back to the context of the battle, Arjuna has never looked upon Krishna as an enlightened guru. He understands he's a very wise person, but he's more of a family member, a mentor rather than a guru. They are two different things. So Krishna has to, uh, you know, literally establish his credentials to Arjuna. It's that situation. Because Arjuna will say, who are you? You know, first he has to, he has to convince him that he has the knowledge. So he gives him the highest. But in our case, we are not in Arjuna's condition in the sense, right now you are not highly agitated. If you are, I mean, no point listening. You got to be in a, obviously all of you want to learn what the philosophy is. So it's important to understand. And then Arjuna partially recovers. Second reason is he needs to give him some time to come out of his emotional state. So partially Arjuna recovers towards the end of the chapter. And he asks him, who is an enlightened soul, right? That's the answer, uh, the, the last part. What is the description of perfection? Partial recovery because Arjuna should ask, what do you want me to do now? In the middle of the battle, they've sounded their conscience. He's asking him, okay, what's enlightenment? It's totally irrelevant to the context. And then again, he gives out the philosophy. Who, what is an enlightened soul? And finally, the recovery is complete in chapter 3, when he asks him. 
jayasi chet karmanaste matab if you consider knowledge superior to action why are you making me do this action then so now he is actually brought down to earth what do you want me to do now and that's karma yoga it's not knowledge is superior to action knowledge has to precede any action you must understand what you are doing so that is karma yoga but for us it's clear you are in sorrow whether you know it or not if you say i am okay you are just acclimatized it's like a slum dweller saying i am okay in the slum you are not okay you don't you don't know it because you are used to it you need to gain the knowledge of what that truth is and then act to get there that's the sequence so we'll start with verse 1 you all okay so far hmm? everybody clear hmm sanjay uvacha tam tatha kripaya vishtam ಅಶ್ರಪೂರ್ಣಾಕುಲೇಕ್ಷಣ ಸಂಜಯ ಸೆಟ್ ಟು ಹಿಮ್ ಹೂ ವಾಸ್ ದಸ್ ಓವರ್ಕಮ್ ವಿತ್ ಪಿಚಿ ಹೂಸ್ ಐಸ್ ವರ್ ಫಿಲ್ ವಿತ್ ಟಿಯರ್ಸ್ ಹೂ ವಾಸ್ ಆಜಿಟೇಟೆಡ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಡಿಸ್ಪಾಂಡೆಂಟ್ madhusudana spoke these words so he continues from chapter 1 why he is continuing the same strain is to convey that this ignorance which creates sorrow in life is very deep rooted it doesn't go chapter 1 over sorrow over now let's talk about bliss no life is not like that because we have not worked on removing our ignorance and have unintelligently gone along with our minds and become totally attached and obsessed with the world you have to pay the price all of you should understand that vedanta is not some miracle suddenly you are agitated for a lifetime one day everything will be okay it it will be okay but it takes time the same arjuna at the end of the 18th chapter said i am fully all right now so it's it's the knowledge will obviously remove all the ignorance but it takes time so that's what he's conveying it continues so don't be disheartened and it will affect you at all levels so physically he said crying that's the physical affectation the eyes were full of tears mentally agitated and intellectually despondent confused doubtful unclear so this goes on in life your intellect is deluded so you're confused your mind is agitated your body gets affected but the whole thing can be reversed that is the beauty of a human life so don't worry people tell me you know this knowledge has helped me so much it has uh, people who just started so i tell them this is nothing you have to this is just the contrast you're seeing you keep going and it gets better and better this is just the beginning so you got to put in the effort and it will be overcome so madhusudana is another name for krishna as i've explained before so krishna for the first time now he starts he says something this is the second 
verse of chapter 2. He has not spoken yet, Krishna. So this is where he starts speaking. But before you know it, he is interrupted by Arjuna. <laughs> Until he, Arjuna finally surrenders a few verses later. Hmm. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha Kutastva Kashmalamidam Vishame Samupasthitam Anayajushtamaswadyam Akirti Karamarjuna Shri Bhagavan Uvacha Kutastva Kashmalamidam Vishame Samupasthitam Anayajushtamaswadyam Akirti Karamarjuna The Blessed Lord said, Shri Bhagavan Uvacha. Uvacha means said. Bhagavan, the Lord. Whence has this dejection, Utastva Kashmalamidam, come upon you in a crisis? Anarya Jushtam Aswargyam, unworthy of an Aryan, attaining neither heaven nor fame, O Arjuna. So, Krishna finally breaks his silence. So you must understand, or learn this principle of objectivity. Don't impulsively get drawn into any conversation. You must talk only when the person is receptive. So Krishna kept quiet because Arjuna was talking. I told you repeatedly. He didn't interrupt him at all. There's no point. If a person is number one, emotional, number two, convinced what they are doing is correct, there is no point talking. It's like talking to a wall. In fact, if you keep quiet, there is a chance the person may go introvert. I am going on talking, the fellow is not responding, maybe I am talking some nonsense. So in fact, the silence makes it much more better if you keep quiet. If you want to convey something else. That's what he did. So he so Bhagavan is a is a title given to an enlightened soul who serves the society by giving out the knowledge, by taking care of the people. So Krishna met all three criteria. He was revered as a Bhagavan. Not only was he enlightened, but he made it his mission to serve the society around him with the knowledge and with his expertise, both gross and subtle intellect. So he was conferred this title those days. So he asked him, where has this dejection come upon you? In a crisis. Just see, he is saying there is a crisis and then he is asking, where has this dejection come from? Where are you? Do Why are you agitated? In other words, in this crisis, what is the uh, implication there? Very interesting. There is a crisis. Why are you dejected? Means what? It is an opportunity for him to, it is an opportunity for us to, it's an opportunity for Arjuna. He's saying there's a big crisis. Obviously, you should be dejected. No, he's saying why are you dejected in such a big crisis? See, the first lesson itself is implied. Because he is in that field that we have to find, and then he is in that field. I am dejected with these answers. <laughs> You should not be dejected. Huh? Crisis should not lead to dejection. It has nothing to do with the external crisis or situation. Dejection is an internal reaction. 
so what he's saying is yes there's a crisis why what is your problem in other words why are you getting taken down by it see first lesson is given we all believe it's the world which agitates us right my wife is like that the economy is like that the government is like that who's going to get elected who going to is thing everything you blame the world all that is going on that's the world why are you letting it get to you that's the first lesson so you don't have the technology you don't have the expertise to not let the world affect you that's his message in other words you don't have an intellect what gets dejected by the external world is your mind mind is emotions it is the intellect which can reason it's hot outside mind will get agitated i'm hot i'm hot intellect analyzes summer will be hot bear the heat go into an air conditioned room whatever it is that's your intellect mind just reacts i'm giving the simplest example even this people are not able to apply all the time agitated so you have to learn to build your intellect to handle the crisis don't blame the crisis because the world is crisis when was a time there was no crisis in the world so first mistake no intellect unworthy of an aryan so the aryan race is the race that inhabited ancient india who created the vedas the upanishads right now it has been in the west is given this is a bad word because the nazis adopted it it nothing to do with them they came uh, 50 years ago this is thousands of years ago arya arya referred to a person who pursued self realization that was the significance of the word these fellows take something and make a racist thing out of it so don't go by that that is not what he means even the swastika symbol they inverted it and made it their symbol crazy fellows you know. so so it is like it is unbelievable what uh, what has happened so you go by the ancient meaning of it which is a person pursuing the self so he says no person who's dedicated to enlightenment which is the calling card of our race that's what krishna is saying you don't behave like this you behave according to your obligations so he says unworthy of an aryan neither attaining heaven no fame so the first goal is self realization which he which he calls unworthy of an aryan then he says neither attaining heaven heaven refers to future benefit of your present action so if you if you are a warrior you are put you are working for righteousness you will be rewarded in the future karma cause and effect you will neither get enlightenment neither will you get the peace of your action and in the present you will be considered a coward neither will you have fame akirti so he is trying to get to him through all angles the present benefit future benefit enlightenment all three are gone by this cowardly action so i told you people look for present happiness future success and enlightenment right the gita in fact talks about this siddhim sukham param gatim success happiness and the supreme he says all three will be gone you gain nothing by this action so first lesson don't blame the external world and when you act you must act consistent with enlightenment if you do that you will even gain present benefits in the world until you hit the supreme so what's your problem just go fight the war that's what he's trying to imply
and he continues in three. Klaibyam, unman, yield not to unmanliness, O Partha, it does not befit you. Casting off this mean weakness of heart, arise, O Parantapa. So, having tried to inspire him with the goals of life, now Krishna uses provocation. He implies he is an unmanly person, Klaibyam which is an extreme provocation for a person like Arjuna, who is the greatest warrior of those days. He is calling him a, a, neither a man nor a woman. Basically, that's what it means. He says, because a woman would stay home, at least those days. Now, don't say nowadays we have in the middle. I am not, nothing against that. I am talking about those days. Those days, a woman stayed home. Whether right or wrong, I don't know. And the men came to fight. So he's saying, you're neither a man nor a woman. Because a woman stays home. A man comes to fight. You've come to fight and you want to go home. Hmm. So he's ex extreme provocation. Arjuna can't handle that. Don't yield to that, he says. <coughs> it does not befit you. Cast off this mean smallness, weakness of your heart. Arise, O Parantapa. And he uses the word Parantapa, scorcher of enemies, to remind him who he is. So, in fact, in all the scriptures, not just Vedanta, they use this fighting to convey the spiritual path because the whole spiritual path is a fight between you and your mind. Conquer your mind, you conquer the world. There's a saying. So what is like uh, Christ and Satan, right? He says, get thee behind me, Satan. I'll have none at thy hand. Satan represents the mind. So the same thing he's saying here. Cast off this weakness of your mind and do what ought to be done. You are a great warrior. Live up to that. So, spiritually speaking, this has happened to us. We are right now controlled by our mind. Our intellect is very weak. So, you have to grow your intellect, fight your mind and get back to yourself. This is the actual fight, the effort in life you should be undertaking. In fact, he says that in the third chapter, he calls the desire the enemy and he says, you've got to fight it. Very hard to conquer this enemy. But Arjuna, obviously, is too much for him. Just two, two verses. So he comes back to his original frame of mind here. Four. Arjuna Uvacha Katham Bhishma Maham Sankhe Dronam Chamadhu Sudana Ishubhe Pratiyotsyami Pujar Havari Sudana Arjuna Uvacha Arjuna 
Arjuna said, How shall I, O Madhusudana, fight with arrows against Bhishma and Drona in battle? They who are worthy of worship, O Arisudana. So again, Arjuna has not understood the first lesson that it's not the external situation. You are not able to handle it. So again, he's attributing his problem to the external world. That it's the battle, this prospect of fighting my kith and kin, my gurus and elders, which is giving me the problem. It's not. But you're convinced. See, in fact, I've told you in any introductory talk I give, that is the first lesson. It is not the world. If I was to take you privately and ask you, okay, what is what what do you think causes you stress in life? What will you tell? Everything is perfect. It's just that man outside, that husband of mine. If you can take care of him, I'll do anything. I don't know what they mean by taking care. And uh, if, uh, or my children, God, I'm having so much trouble with that teenage son. You, I can't it. see. It's external. My boss. Who was I talking to? Ah, uh, I'd gone to the bank, and there's some problem with the system. So we were just sitting there waiting for the system to boot. So she started talking. Where do you live? At? I said, yeah. so the branch is right here. So I asked her, where do you live? She said, I'm in Bridgewater. Uh, uh, you know, it's just six and a half miles. I said, yeah, Bridgewater is the next town. What's the problem? Takes me 40 minutes every evening. I thought she's going to hit me. She was so agitated. You know, I said, what have I done? <laughs> traffic. It's so close by, but look at the traffic. Traffic, that 287, that road also she wants to, uh, wants to do something to the road. Now, what has the road done? Hmm? I said, I told her, I said, traffic time, there will be traffic. No worries. When you go on the road, everybody else also wants to go on the road. Hmm? What can you do? All you people then work the same time. No, no, whose fault is there? Why are you blaming the road or the town? You know? Traffic is a problem. Boss is a problem. Have you ever said, ask yourself, what is wrong with me that I am not able to handle the situation? Has anybody ever asked that? That's the day you become philosophical. Okay, my husband is like that. My wife is like that. I agree to all that. But why am I disturbed about it? Why am I letting it affect me? Nobody will ever ask that. And that is the main thing of becoming spiritual. What do I need to do to correct myself so I am not affected by this? Then you are getting somewhere. So same thing he said, how can I, what do you expect me? Of course I will be agitated. People like Bhishma and Drona have to fight. What is wrong with you? In other words, he is saying that. So first of all, that has no meaning. Second of all, the issue has been magnified to such a staggering degree in the Gita. You must understand that. Here a person is being asked to not only fight but kill people he has revered all his life. Like Bhishma and Drona, his teachers, his elders, his gurus. So the Gita has magnified it to such a degree to show it's not the action which matters. It's the intention behind it, which makes it right or wrong. The action obviously seems so deadly, killing people who you respect. But what's the intention behind it? They are fighting on the side of people who have destroyed the country, totally unrighteous. So the intention is to protect the country, the people. 
it's fine and still in india people don't understand this because the gita also says in a different context ahimsa non violence no they translated as non violence non killing it's not that it's an attitude of not wanting to hurt that is ahimsa but if it has to be done it has to be done it's like you see a beautiful dog you obviously you don't want any harm to it but if it becomes rabid what do you do it has to be put down it will destroy the whole neighborhood so the kauravas were like rabid literally rabid individuals in that society that whole thing had to be destroyed and see the implication how psychological implication what is he addressing krishna as madhu sudana killer of madhu ari sudana killer of enemies just see he is addressing krishna as that as a person who kills but who does he kill madhu means sweet means that instant pleasure of the mind which attaches you to the world the whole fight is to destroy that attachment and move to the real infinite joy of the self it is this instant gratification which is your real enemy which you don't realize prevents you from getting to the self so so many messages they have given for us to understand so don't blame the external world so he continues in fight and then finally in 6 and 7 he rests thank god for us if i finally says i don't know what i'm talking that's the time krishna really talks hmm. guru na hatva hi mahanubhavan sheyo bhoktum dhaiksham api haloke hatva thaka mastu guru ni haiva gunjiya bhoga rudhira better indeed to live on arms in this world than to slay the most noble teachers but by slaying them all my enjoyments of wealth and desires even here will be stained with blood see see the contradiction now again he is personalizing the whole situation if you do what you ought to do in life and you're convinced that is the right thing to do which he was earlier he just got into a temporary emotion you will not have any regrets you will not have any problems in spite of the action being of killing it's like a soldier trying to protect his homeland he kills the invading army he's not going to have a problem with his sleep right he's going to in fact sleep very good that he did what he ought to do it's like that so he doesn't know what he's talking and secondly again he's personalizing it my enjoyments will be stained with blood so who's who's saying that this war is fought for your kingdom and enjoyment it's not so he's worried about the guilt conscience that will mar his future wrong perception of the war so again he is continuing from his confused state of mind but independently if you are selfish here the war was not selfish but independently it's true if you are selfish and you do the wrong thing you will not be able to enjoy it it's not possible 
See, Macbeth, he murdered Duncan. If you've seen the play or read the book, or watched the movie, in fact, you watch it, no, in the retreats, Macbeth. Uh, so he kills Duncan, the, his king, because he wants the throne. Those of you who don't know Macbeth, and he comes out of the room and he looks at his hands and says, I have murdered sleep. He sees blood on his hands, which he constantly tries to clean, but it doesn't go throughout the play. But in that moment, he says, Macbeth had murdered sleep. I have murdered sleep. And he never slept after that. And his wife, Lady Macbeth, who instigated him, she also went mad with guilt. How can you sit on that throne? So they are racked with guilt. That's why they have to have drinks and all kinds of things to keep them to sleep. So it's no, it's, there's no point. Rather sleep well than to do these wrong things in life. So with Vedanta, it's very clear. Your intellect follows your conscience. Your conscience, intellect, mind and action are fully aligned. So there is never any problem in life. And even if you do something wrong inadvertently, you will correct it. So where is the problem? Intellect will be alert. So you will sleep. That's the test of a life of whether you are on the right track or not. How long does it take you to sleep? That's all. Whole night tossing and turning. That shows something is wrong somewhere. Or you hit the pillow, you should be out. Till the alarm wakes you. Alarm wakes you and you go back to sleep also is okay. At least you are sleeping, right? Not disturbing others. Hmm. What is that? Deepanjali. You have a question? Um, yes, Hari Om Guruji. Huh. Um, so, uh, my question was, uh, when there are consistent rejections and uh, happening in life, uh, even though it's an external factor, but it is affecting uh, my current life right now, it's affecting my present actions and decisions. Uh, in this scenario, uh, how can we control the mental agitation? See, when you say, uh, obviously we can't discuss uh, your personal situation. Generally, I'm saying, when you say there's a constant rejection, you have to analyze why is it happening. Argument sake, you're applying for a job which is beyond your capacity beyond your qualifications, obviously there will be constant rejection. It's like that. You have to analyze what is the reason behind it and take steps to correct that. And as long as you are doing the best you can, if others are not satisfied with it, why are you bothered? See, there is a saying again coming back to Shakespeare, to thine own self be true. It must follow as night the day. Thou canst not then be false to any man. So you need to work on improving yourself, being true to what you believe. Beyond that, mm -hmm. uh, they don't like it. Hmm. It's their problem, not yours. So analyze where you're going wrong, correct it, be true to yourself and continue your life. Hmm. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you, Buddha. Six. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
nor do we know which is better for us should we conquer them or they should conquer us the very sons of dhritarashtra whom having slain we do not wish to live stand facing us so the first signs of awareness comes here for arjuna first time he has said i don't know what i should do should i conquer them or should they conquer us so the first signs of that questioning that awareness see you will gain knowledge only when you are aware of your ignorance remember that otherwise how can you gain knowledge if you believe you know it's not possible the josh billings is a great philosopher he says the trouble with most folks is not so much their ignorance as they are knowing as many things which ain't so the trouble with people is not that they don't know they believe they know things which are not true that's the problem see you will go to a doctor only when you believe you are unwell and you don't know how to cure it you will not go to a doctor a if you believe you are well and b if you unwell but you believe you know how to cure it why will you go so either people are not aware of their ignorance or they believe they know things which are not true so to be aware and have the humility to say these three words i don't know hmm. there are categories of people i have never heard those three words anything you ask do you know how to cure leukemia yeah i think i do just wait i'll give a, they will not say i don't know i am not an oncologist i don't know that word will never come out they everything they know any cultured person the first thing they will say is i don't know they have no problem saying that and they are the most knowledgeable people people who say i don't know you should stick with them because they actually know or they'll at least tell you where to go because they understand their ignorance see either you should know something in life or you should know where to go when you don't know most people think they know and they have no clue who's the person who knows just see the contrast right this is absolute ignorance <coughs> so first thing i don't know what i should do should they conquer them should they conquer us and then again he includes krishna very sons of dhritarashtra whom having slain we don't wish to live he is including we whole army we all don't want to live so poor fellow he is confused and finally in 7 is where he surrenders i don't know what i am saying please help me hmm? kaipanya dosho pahatasvabhavah pricchavetvam dharma sammodhacheta ಶಾಧಿಮಾಧರ್ಮಸಮೂಢಚೇತಾ ಮೈ ನೇಚರ್ ಇಸ್ ಓವರ್ ಪಾವರ್ಡ್ ಬೈ ದ ಟೇಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಪಿಟಿ 
with my mind confused as to duty i ask thee tell me decisively what is good for me i am thy disciple instruct me who has taken refuge in thee see first time he now admits to himself i don't know my need my mind is totally overpowered by this emotion my intellect is confused what to do so please tell me what to do i am your disciple means i am coming to you for guidance so always remember we are very very prompt in giving advice to our spouses children especially children poor things because they have to listen they have no choice but knowledge is always taken knowledge is never given remember that simple fact knowledge is taken a person has to be receptive they should want to know you can't give knowledge it has to be taken in fact this knowledge was never given the guru sat in the himalayas in the forest wherever they were and they know they have the knowledge and they know that a person who wants the knowledge will come where else will they go it's like a lake just collects water a lake doesn't go and advertise water water what whoever wants water comes and takes it that's how you should be so if you want to help anybody what should your goal be keep gaining the knowledge to the extent you are competent people will come there's a saying a stone fit for the wall will not lie on the way a stone that is fit is so beautiful that it's fit for a wall will it lie on the road somebody will take it right it's not meant for the road so when you say nobody ask me no what does that mean no yeah. now you fill in the blanks nobody has ever asked me anything nobody ever takes my advice hmm what does that mean you don't know anything it's as simple as that it's like uh, uh, steve jobs will say nobody uh, nobody looks at my invention nobody is interested how is it possible it's not possible so first thing awareness of your ignorance in fact it's the test of knowledge see when einstein was asked sir how do you have so much knowledge you know what his answer was what is my knowledge compared to my ignorance yes i know a few things but what is that compared to what i don't know is infinite what i don't know. so he was always hungry for more knowledge because he was always aware what he doesn't know so you just have even if you pretend literally that look i don't know anything you have no idea how much knowledge you'll get every morning you sit with the books you should have that i really don't know anything it just goes right in yeah so so when you say um, just keep quiet um so practically uh, sometimes keeping quiet in an argument is considered micro aggressor aggression so how, how do you how do you deal with it and you know when the other person is really raving they expect you to answer or say something and you just keep quiet so some practical tips of how to address that well, what do you ask <laughs> uh, in an argument sometimes when you keep quiet <laughs> it's considered micro aggressive aggression hmm? aggression so the person is ranting and raving not in this room no that person ha huh? <laughs> and uh, they expect you to fight back that's what you're saying 
so see first of all you have to constantly monitor a situation right if the person is totally convinced what they know and they are giving you their opinion there is no point trying to change that now when you when you are saying you it's implied that they are looking for a response respond appropriately in that situation person is saying say something say something say something and kiran is <laughs> unless i assess that you really want to know <laughs> i'm not going to say anything obviously they'll consider you my not micro macro aggressive you understand you may get a instead of words you may get a missile in your head so you be careful so you got to assess the situation they're looking for a response that time you respond appropriately whatever they are trying to whatever respond is appropriate that's all so we are talking about a person has not asked you for advice why are you advising them but if a advice is implied or requested then you you will be able to see and beyond that they want to rant and rave like them rant and rave what is your problem another as long as you are not responsible for their agitation people have nothing else to do let them be agitated so obviously there is a wrong assessment somewhere of the situation got it hmm there is a question from prash guru ji arjuna was in the battle field hmm and he had to ask an introspect and surrender for us where we are not in such situations should be self analyze daily and is that meditation should we ask our spouse or children on feedback on ourselves <laughs> so uh, you basically what you are asking is arjuna had the guidance of somebody and so in our life that doesn't happen right so the guidance who said is not happen that is vedanta see the more you learn every morning you should sit with the literature i told you there's a proper course of study 12 books which my guru has written and after a lot of research he has worked on that sequence it's 12 books covered in 3 years that's the e learning course many of you are doing it those of you who are not you should definitely think about it as a systematic structured study of vedanta that will be your guide and if you have any questions on the knowledge i have a q and a session specifically meant to clear your doubts so that's how we proceed uh you can email your questions and i answer them so you it will take some time but you will get a general clarity in a few months year maybe you will have a general clarity of life you are committed to the knowledge and asking others uh, see others should recognize the change in you definitely that will happen they will recognize that you used to lose your temper so quickly now you don't lose it that much that changes people will recognize but asking feedback from people who are equally ignorant like you i mean what sense does that make even if you ask feedback it should be somebody wiser than you if spouse and if your spouse and children are wiser than you then yes please ask them right otherwise the knowledge itself will be your feedback you will know where you're going wrong and right that is the knowledge so just keep learning keep growing that's all you need and if there are any questions you can always ask we i told you we have a q and a session for that right so before we end uh, i announced yesterday those of you who were not there our last in person retreat of the year will be september 27 to 29th in the catskills upstate new york or oh, there it is that's the actual campus which you see on your screen uh, that's the lecture hall which you see in the middle there and uh, beautiful place uh, about 2 and 1/2 hours from manhattan just to give you a and even if any one of you is coming from out of town it's not a problem lot of people come and we have volunteers here which can help you with going to the venue and back to the airport um i'm going to be teaching select verses from mundaka upanishad 
So if you think the Gita is elevating, Upanishads are far more ancient and more deep in terms of their philosophical contents, very cryptic. They are the originals, original scriptures. So it's a great experience to study them together, life, along with your peers, you know, in that beautiful setting. So definitely would recommend if you are interested, the email will go out in a, uh, after the class today, it's scheduled to go out. So you'll get it um, and you can register. Any questions, let us know. Okay. So we will continue on uh, Wednesday, otherwise next weekend as usual. Hari Om.